I'm here with uh, Professor Steve Ferber, CBE, uh, here at Manchester University. Um, thanks very much for your time uh, you're, you're giving to us here. Um, just like to talk to you really about ACORN and your involvement with ACORN and, uh, and, and really what it's led to today. Um, you obviously were born and raised here in, in Manchester uh, and went down to uh, Cambridge uh, to, to study university there. Um, what got you involved with, with uh, ACORN? Well, I was at the university. I, I read maths as an undergraduate and I went on to do a PhD in aerodynamics. And during my PhD, I got interested in aspects of flight. Um, and uh, then I heard about the formation of the Cambridge University Processor Group, and I thought, well, maybe I should join up with these guys and see if I can build myself a flight simulator or something right. like that. Um, so I was involved in the University Processor Group from its foundation, although I wasn't actually a founder. Right. Um, I, I went along to the very first meetings um, and started building computers for fun, um, which was fairly scary in those days because uh, the components um, had to be ordered by mail order using a credit card from California. Mm. And uh, I was a student, um, so credit cards were fairly scary then and using them internationally was even more scary. But we got the microprocessors. Uh, my first machine was based on the Signetix 2650, oh, right. which uh, not many people have heard of these no, days. Good. And it had a, a full kilobyte of static RAM main memory and I assembled printed circuit boards using Vero wire, uh -huh. which was a little wiring pen where you hand wire the things together. Yeah. And, I, and you soldered it, which melted the insulation to make the connections. And I understand it gave off carcinogenic vapors. Absolutely. But, yeah. but it hasn't got me yet. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's how I built these things. And I built myself a, a small rack. Right. I couldn't afford a commercial rack, so I made one. Um, and got this 2650 system going. And in the, in the processor group, you know, the enthusiasts exchanged notes with each other, yeah, and I, I remember Sophie Wilson coming around to my house uh, for one meeting of the processor group, looking at my machine and poking away at it and finding you know, faults in the memory <laughs> and, right. and stuff like that. Um, and then, um, while I was still uh, a PhD student in the engineering department, um, Herman Hauser came knocking on my door. Um, explained that, that he and Chris Curry were thinking of starting a consultancy company in the mm -hmm. microprocessor business and they'd been you know, looking uh, to the university processor group as the source of technical people who might be able to help them with this and he mm -hmm. asked me if I was interested and mm -hmm. I said well I'm, you know, I'm just a hobbyist I've been doing this for fun but you know if you think I can help I'm willing to give it a go um, and that's how I joined the embryonic acorn uh -huh. yeah, before it was acorn. Right. Was it based that's, uh, inside Sinclair's uh, building at the time? I believe that sort of started there. Yeah, the first things we did uh, were in the Science of Cambridge building in King's Parade, right. um, uh, where Chris Curry had, w was set up running Science of yeah. Cambridge with Clive, yeah. and, um, and, and Herman and Chris. Uh, did bits of acorn work in there. In fact, the first thing I did for acorn um, was it was actually not for Acorn, it was for Science of Cambridge. I built, right. I hand built the prototype MK14. Ah, uh, so uh -huh. I got the circuit diagram and built one using Vera wire and, yeah. and, and soldered in my front room. And the, the MK14 was basically a copy of a National Semiconductor mm. SCAMP development yeah. kit. Yeah. Um, and they'd taken what was a mask programmed ROM in the development kit and they copied it into two fusible link proms for the MK14 and they managed to copy it wrong. Um, so I, I debugged this thing in my front room. Right. Right? That was the first you know, piece of work I did for them. Right. Fantastic. Uh, and then um, Chris and Herman got a contract to do some development work on um, microprocessor controlled fruit machines, mm -hmm. which were very new at that time. Up to that date, fruit machines had all been controlled by relays yeah. and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So this was an early attempt to do microprocessor stuff. Right. Um, and we used two scamps um, in a rack to control this fruit machine. Uh -huh. um, and uh, In fact, the, the software for that was bootstrapped off the 2650 machine I built in the, in the processor group. It right. was used as a dumb terminal into the scamp development kit. Um, and, and we brought this fruit machine controller up. Fantastic. The, the, 
the main challenge in those days was was um, to make these things robust. Yeah. Because very early on, people had discovered that with electronic cigarette lighters, if you just spark them That's it. next yeah. to the fruit machine, they'd often Probably pay out. jumps off somewhere yeah. else and all sorts of things. So that that was when Sophie Wilson came in. Mm -hmm. She designed an, an FM receiver front end, which would trigger whenever you flicked one of these cigarette lighters and cause the scamps to reset. So. Mm -hmm. um, it would definitely not pay out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> that was the requirement. That okay. uh, if, if, if you interfered with it, it should definitely not pay out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and the things were tested by plugging a, a mains adapter into the wall, plugging the fruit machine into one socket, and an arc welding transformer into the right. other. Yeah, and <laughs> it's just plugging somebody it welded out. metal together while you operated <laughs> the fruit machine to see uh, to see if uh, uh, the things were right. yeah, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. I mean, the, the, the whole feeling at that time, it was very much a sort of a hobbyist and you know, people doing uh, processor-based work, just pretty much out of love at that time, wasn't it? You know, you just enjoy doing that kind of thing. Yeah. And the whole industry pretty much come out of that, is that That's right, say? because we are talking the late 1970s yeah. now, so we, we're before the IBM PC, mm -hmm. um, uh, this started before the Apple II had appeared, mm -hmm. um, so there were some very basic box machines, the Altair, yeah. I think probably had appeared about this time in yeah. the States. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, very much a, yeah. a US machine. Yeah, so um, in, the, in the University Processor Group, um, you know, the real men built computers out of TTL. Right. It was only the wimps like me that, that, <laughs> that used these newfangled microprocessors, which were, were kind of cheating because you got too much in one package. Right. Um, but yes, microprocessors were just entering the public consciousness, mm. so um, the MK14 from Science of Cambridge was an example of a microprocessor on a printed circuit board mm. with a he hexadecimal keypad, yeah. a seven segment Incredibly uh, display, yeah. and, and you, you could put assembly code into it and make it run, and uh, Sophie saw the MK14 and said something which she said many times, which was basically, uh, I could do better than that. Went home with Easter holiday and came back with a design she called the Hawk, which was 6502 based. Yeah. And uh, Herman looked at this and thought he could sell it, and that became the Acorn System, System One. one right. And the name Acorn was introduced originally just as a trading name. Um, the company was called Cambridge Processor Unit Limited. Yeah, I mean, an interesting point there is that you look at those machines today, the System One and, and the Mark 14, and they are to what most people would describe as unusable. Um, but these things sold in, 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 you know, in a big way, really. Oh, the System 1, um, yeah, and the MK14 um, sold faster than people could put kits together. Yeah. The System 1, I think, was mainly sold as a kit, so yeah. you, you got the parts and you had to solder it together. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there was lots of interest, yeah. um, and it was Really, the only way a member of the general public could get their hands on anything that looked like a computer yeah, at that could time. actually touch a computer. You know, real computers cost a million pounds and lived in clean rooms and were only touched by men in white coats. Um, Absolutely. These things you could buy for a hundred or two mm. um, yeah. and play with at home. Yeah, and it was just the, the, the want to own one of these things, the want to be able to control one of these things, and a lot of it was driven by the science fiction of it all and, and make these things do. Well, of course, one, one, of the, the, one of the real science, science fiction aspects is they got used as props in TV shows as well. Yeah. So the Acorn System 1 was featured as the computer on Blake 7. Um, we, you know, we, there was quite a lot of competition between Acorn and Sinclair at the time, and, and, and Clive Sinclair had proudly boasted that you could control the nuclear power station with the ZX81. Yeah. Well, you know, this was nothing compared with controlling a 21st century interstellar cargo ship with an Acorn System 1. So. <laughs> Win hands down. That's right. <laughs>